We have all watered plants, whether it be a cornfield, a home lawn, or a house plant on a window seal. We all know that plants above all need water. Forget to fertilize your house plant, it survives. Forget to water, it dies. Take a look at these two pepper plants and see the physiological changes happening. I'm Dr. DeBusk and in this video we'll talk about how plants use water and how we can measure it. On the average, plants consume 500 to 700 pounds of water to produce a single pound of dry plant matter. A single corn plant may absorb as much as 50 gallons of water during the growing season. A tomato plant over 30. Obviously, most plants require very large amounts of water and water deficiency commonly limits growth and productivity. Water availability also partly defines what plants occupy which natural ecosystems. Water is vital to growers and ecosystems because of several functions it serves in plant growth. Plant cells are largely made up of water. Plant tissue is 50% to 90% water, depending on the type of tissue. When plant cells are full of water, plant tissue is turgid, stiff, because of internal water pressure. This keeps stems upright and leaves expanded to receive sunlight. The internal water pressure causes cells to expand, promoting larger leaves, larger internodes, and rapid growth. Photosynthesis uses water as a building block in the manufacture of carbohydrates. Transpiration or evaporation of water on the leaf cools the plant. Plant nutrients dissolved in soil water move toward roots through the water. Water is thus important in making nutrients available to plants. Water carries materials such as nutrients and carbohydrates throughout the plant. Water is the solvent in which chemical reactions occur in the plant. Moist soil has lower strength than dry soil, easing root growth. Water stress is caused by a shortage of water in plant tissue. Stress occurs even at moisture levels that do not cause wilting because as soil dries, it becomes increasingly difficult for a plant to absorb moisture. As the plant becomes deficient in water, guard cells begin to close stomata, slowing exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide. Reduced exchange of the two gases slows photosynthesis and plant growth is inhibited. As soil dries further, the plant becomes even more water deficient. The plant begins to lose water faster than it can be absorbed and it temporarily wilts. At this temporary wilting point, the plant recovers when conditions improve. Wetter soil, cooler soil, a more humid atmosphere, shade, or less wind help the plant recover. Although the plant recovers, episodes of water stress reduce growth and yields. With further drying, soil becomes too dry for the plant to access any water and the permanent wilting point is reached. Now the plant will not recover even if conditions improve. Note that the permanent wilting point is simply a function of soil while the temporary wilting point occurs when one plant process, transpiration, exceeds another, water absorption. Plants suffering from chronic water stress exhibit a variety of symptoms, including small, poorly colored leaves, loss of leaf turgor, and reduced growth. Old leaves often turn yellow and drop off. Some plants show specific symptoms of water stress. For example, the leaves of corn plants curl when they need water, and the leaves of sugar maple trees scorch. Water stress can dispose plants to other stresses and problems. For example, the combination of dry soil and humid air leads to powdery mildew infections in plants such as garden flocks. Seed germination is very sensitive to water shortage. While seeds efficiently absorb moisture through the seed coat, the emerging seedling is easily injured by dry soil. Excess moisture displaces air from soil pores. While small amounts of oxygen are dissolved in water, it is quickly used up by soil organisms, so wet soil rapidly becomes oxygen deficient or anaerobic. Plant roots require oxygen for respiration. Roots lacking oxygen fail to take up water and nutrients properly, so plants growing in wet soil often exhibit symptoms of nutrient deficiency or even wilt. Fungal diseases attack the damaged roots, causing root rot. Carbon dioxide and toxic materials often build up in the soil, further damaging roots. Symptoms of overwatering can resemble those of underwatering, but it is slower to develop and often more difficult to recognize and treat. Plant species vary in their tolerance of soil saturation. Wetland plants possess adaptations to soil wetness, while others, such as tomato, may die within a few hours of wet feet. Greenhouse growers are particularly concerned about water. Root rots and small flies called fungus gnats easily make their home in pots that are too damp. 
and the excess water available to the plant stretches the cells to cause long internodes and large leaves. Put another way, the plant stretches. Many greenhouse operators grow dry, keeping the plant on the dry side to prevent root rots and stretch, decreasing the need for pesticides and growth regulators. There are several scientific ways to measure water content. Gravimetric methods directly measure soil water content by weight. This gravimetric water content can then be converted to other useful quantities. To measure water content of a soil sample by weight, the sample is weighed and the weight recorded. The sample is then oven dried and the dry weight noted. The difference between the two weights is the weight of water in the soil. Water content is the amount of moisture divided by the oven dry weight. Suppose one needs to measure water content of a soil at field capacity. A sample is taken two days after a heavy rain. If the sample weight were 150 grams when wet and 127 grams when dry, the moisture content would be 0.18 or 18% when converted to a percentage. It is often more useful to calculate water content on a volume basis. This problem can be solved by making a weight determination and converting it to volumetric water content using soil and water densities, density being mass per volume. The equation for the conversion is volumetric water content equals gravimetric water content times soil bulk density divided by water density. The density of water is 1.0 grams per cubic centimeter. In the previous example, if the bulk density of the soil sample were 1.5 grams per cubic centimeter, the water can content by volume would be 0.27. A meteorologist measures rain in inches of water. Irrigation is measured in inches as well. Inches of water is a convenient, easily visualized unit that can also be used to measure the amount of water in a soil. Let us say one could take one cubic foot of soil and squeeze all the water out of it into a one square foot cake pan. How many inches of water would be in that pan? This can be calculated simply by the equation inches of water per foot soil equals 12 inches times volumetric water content. In the previous sample, then the inches of water per foot soil would be 3.24. In the sample, each foot of soil depth contains 3.24 inches of water. If a soil profile were three feet deep and each foot was the same, then the total of the entire profile would be 9.72 inches of total water. What if you don't have all the numbers? One new tool is a water-soluble marking dye that can demonstrate how water and nitrogen fertilizer move through the soil profile following irrigation. This can be done for turf or agriculture. This is how it is done on turf. Irrigation is applied to the turf after dye was applied to two areas, each three square foot, marked by the stakes. Notice that a container is catching the irrigation water to measure the amount of irrigation applied. More irrigation is applied to the second treatment area so that it receives a higher amount of irrigation while the first area is covered with the tarp so that it receives a lower amount of irrigation. Digging the dyed areas allows you to see how the dye moves in soils. This photo shows a comparison of the depth that the dye moves in clay soils, left, versus sandy soil, right. From the plant's point of view, the important thing is not how much water is in the soil, but the potential it is held at. A device called a potentiometer, or tensiometer, acts like an artificial root. It measures soil moisture potential, and so gives a root's eye view of how much water is available. A potentiometer is a plastic tube with a vacuum gauge at one end and a porous clay cup at the other end. The tightly closed tube is filled with water, then buried with the gauge sticking out. Dry soil outside the tube pulls water out through the clay cup, creating a partial vacuum inside the tube. The vacuum creates a force that opposes the pull of matrix forces in the soil, and water ceases leaving the tube when the two are equal. At any given moment, the gauge reading the vacuum is then also reading the matrix potential of soil water. Potentiometers work best in moist soil at potentials between 0 and negative 0.8 bars, a narrow range but an important one to plants. Another device for measuring soil moisture is the resistance block. The two electrodes are embedded in a block of gypsum, fiberglass, or other material. The gypsum block 
absorbs water from surrounding soil by capillarity through its own pores. The wetter the surrounding soil, the damper the block becomes. Moisture dissolves some of the gypsum, which is slightly water soluble. The block now contains a solution of water and dissolved gypsum, and this solution conducts electricity. The drier the block, the greater the resistance to electrical current. Gypsum blocks work better in drier soil regimes than do tensiometers. In conclusion, plants need water to survive and can reach a point where they don't bounce back. You can calculate the amount of water in the soil or measure it with devices.